Good evening. Hello and welcome to this evening's event titled Radical Thinkers, the Art, Sex and Politics of Feminism. My name is Sandra Sikorova. I'm the curator of public programs here and it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening, which coincides with the launch of the latest set of the Radical Thinkers series published by Verso. This set has a specific focus on feminism and is intended as an intervention into current feminist discourse with four key texts of contemporary relevance, including books by Lynn Segal, Juliet Mitchell, Sheila Robotham, Michelle Barrett, and Mary McIntosh. Tonight, we're joined by Lynn Segal, whose book Straight Sex has been uh, recently republished as part of this latest series, and by Professor Griselda Pollock to critically consi consider the legacies of feminism in relation to the feminist politics of art, sex, and work, and their enduring relevance to contemporary struggles. Forty years ago, feminist thinkers and artists interrogated the role of women as workers and producers and the representation of women in art. What happened to the new worlds of possibility promised by the women's liberation and second wave feminist movements of the 20th century? These will be some of the questions that we'll be exploring this evening. Now, this evening's chair is Sonia Boyce. Sonia is a British artist living and working in London. She came to prominence in the 1980s with works that spoke about race and gender and has gone on to have an international reputation for creating works that encourage spontaneity and collaboration. Sonia is currently a professor of fine art at Middlesex University and Chair of Black Art and Design at University of the Arts London. I'd also like to introduce our speakers this evening. Uh, we are joined by Lynn Segal, who's Anniversary Professor of Psychology and Gender Studies in the Department of Psychosocial Studies at Birkbeck College. Her many books include Out of Time, The Pleasures and Perils of Aging, and Straight Sex, Rethinking the Politics of Pleasure, that this event is focusing on. She co-wrote Beyond the Fragments, Feminism and the Making of Socialism with Sheila Robotham and Hilary Wainwright. And uh, the first speaker of this evening will be Griselda Pollock, who is a professor of social and critical histories of art and director of the Center for Cultural Analysis, Theory and History at the University of Leeds. Known for her consistent exploration of feminist theory and cultural analysis, her recent publications include after Effect After Image, Trauma and Aesthetic Transformation, published in 2013, and Visual Politics of Psychoanalysis, also published in 2013. Now, to mention a few words about the format of this evening, we'll start with each of our speakers giving about 15 to 20 minute presentations, uh, and this will be followed by an in-conversation, and at about 7.40 or so, we'll open the floor to questions from the audience. Uh, after the event, which we aim to conclude at 8, you'll have a chance to purchase books by both of our speakers and have them signed. So please join us in the adjacent foyer for that. And finally, I'd like to thank Verso for their ongoing partnership with us and for making events like this one happen and possible. So thank you. And now please join me in welcoming our first speaker this evening, which is Griselda Pollock. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, it's uh, um, thank you to Verso, thank you to the Tate, and uh, for this opportunity to join in celebrating the republication of Lynn Siegel's book. Now, at what stage does a historical event become a memory, a cultural memory, and therefore become subject to a politics of remembrance and also of misremembrance? Now that I am of an age to be an individual with memories of political events that shaped me intellectual when I was much younger, I'm intensely aware of a disjuncture with the present. This disconnect falls between what feels to me like a continuous thread that weaves the ever richer cloth of feminist work and thought, and what seems to those engaging now with feminism as an ism as an object lodged in the past to be an object of contested memory, 
So here this evening, we're in the middle of this dilemma. There's a substantial audience interested enough to spend a Monday evening to witness the relaunch of a text written in the 1990s. So like Freud, I am pondering to myself and wondering, what does an audience want? Of me, of Lynn, of Sonia, of art, politics, maybe it's because it's got sex in the title, which is always a winner. And is feminism something vivid enough, despite its considerable age, to draw you here? Now, if we were to imagine ourselves coming together in 1945, for instance, and looking back to an event that occurred uh, 45 years before, we would find ourselves thinking about what happened around 1900, a completely different era. So if we imagine from 1970 to 2015, we're similarly straddling half an era, half a century, and as far as my second year students are concerned at present, their entire lifetime lies between the moment that Lynn's book was published and the moment they encounter my talking about it. Now, such banalities of time gaps aside, my contribution to this evening's discussion about radical thinkers and time concerns a profoundly um, urgent question. I'm just going to turn this timing on. Uh, a profoundly important uh, problem that takes two forms. One is that feminism has been delivered to the present as a bad memory. I don't just mean that in the sense of being something of a nightmare where people say, thank God, that's all gone now. But it's a poorly constructed memory. And this is part, in part the work of those who actively wish to get rid of feminism. But much more problematically, the bad memory of feminism is uh, the product of feminists themselves. They have created a memory of feminism through stories, narratives, formulations, and so forth, that I consider to be destructive of the present and indeed the future potentiality of what feminism represents, a struggle for dignity and safety of those who live variously and differently and even agonistically under the sign woman in relation not only to non-women, but also to other women. So who else but feminists teaches their students that there were generations and waves of feminism? Who else endlessly repeats cliches about essentialism and constructivism? Who else plays activism off against theoretical institutionalization? It seems to me it's time that we analyze, and I mean that psychoanalytically, the deadliness that, this, that repeatedly betrays the radicality of feminism and its attempt to make the sign woman and the political collectivity that that word dares to invoke a radical force for change in the world. So I choose to counter the tendency for what I see feminists acting out phallocentrically as destructive forms of feminine difficulties with intergenerational connection. And I'm going to use two resources tonight offered by two think, uh, forms of radical thinking by women who preceded or had no truck with our history of feminism as radical thinking. The first is Hannah Arendt. Writing of the crisis in education that she witnessed in the United States in the early 1960s, Hannah Arendt concluded an essay of that title, Crisis in Education, with the following formulation of what I understand as transgenerational thinking that defines a non-familial, relation of older and younger people who encounter each other in the field of education. Hannah Arendt writes this, education is the point at which we decide whether we love the world enough to assume responsibility for it, and by the same token, to save it from the ruin which, except for renewal, except for the coming of the new and the young, would be inevitable. And education, too, is where we decide whether we love our children enough not to expel them from our world and leave them to their own devices, nor to strike from their hands their chance of undertaking something new, something unforeseen by us, but to prepare them in advance for the task of renewing our common world. Now, I want to draw an initial distinction from this statement between transgenerational work 
and political and education work it is too, towards building a common world whose antithesis is oppression, injustice, and inclusion, exclusion. And on the other hand, the institutionalization of some kind of canonical knowledge. The latter might be defined in Raymond Williams' terms as a selective tradition that effectively pre-shapes the present and hence determines the limits of the future. If our ambition is the deep democratization of just society through a long-term historical endeavor with all its setbacks and its renewals, we nevertheless need some institutionalization of our histories of thought within that endeavor. And it's here I wish to place the issues of transmission and, as it were, academic institutionalization of the project we call feminism. I suggest that feminism falls between trauma and memory, between the shock of its claim for the right to revolt and the belated and often inadequate forms of the inscription of that revolt into cultural memory. This includes both the lack of any inscription and the problem of false inscription. And in that gap between trauma and cultural memory, feminism always also falls between remembrance, a sense that it happened at all back then, and iconography, its translation into images, icons, narratives, representations, gossip. Representation always selectively constructs its, the insertion of feminism to cultural memory or remembrance in ways that continuously mark the traumatic nature of feminism to the culture in which it happens and to those who call themselves feminists and to women in general. It is an undigestible force, a shocking force, a force for profound change that takes a makes a demand of those who engage with it. And its force passes through stages of adjustment, sometimes mainstreaming, sometimes not, without ever exhausting what I call its ever-present virtuality. So rather than the tired and debilitating and endlessly repeated attempts to wash feminism away as a series of waves, or to trap it in the endless stories of angry daughters protesting against overpowering generational mothers, an idea actually initially put forward by Rebecca Walker in writing of her relationship to her mother, Alice Walker, and her generation. I think we should understand feminism as a project destined to divide the field of which it is in effect. What does that mean? Let me introduce the political theory of agonism, which suggests that the struggle for democracy is constantly fissured by the emergence of new conflicts that themselves become possible, and creatively so, as a result of the preceding moves. Without the very concept of women in the world unite as a performative invocation of an entirely new political subjectivity, the nature of the specific divisions between women as women might have remained foreclosed behind the political vocabularies that were indifferent to gender or sexuality and the gendered specificities of classed and colonized as well as racialized violence. So had we not first called for this notion of woman, the issues which we now confront, which see that this is a fissured field, would not in themselves even have risen to the level of acknowledgement. Agonism posits conflict as a dynamic and inevitable dimension of the continuous work for democracy. So instead of plotting generations and waves, we might better read feminist work as creative and radical precisely in so far as it continuously throws up conflicts that become visible precisely because of working through another one. Instead of complaining that Euro-American women's movement was too white and middle class or too straight, which it was and actually was not because there were always women of every uh, color and class and sexuality involved. So instead of that, and instead of the notion that a new generation arose to correct the mistakes of the first generation, we perhaps could understand that um, the uh, feminism appeared, the agonisms of class, sexualities, racialized and geopolitical difference of the dynamics that became articulable and necessary on the ground indifferently opened up by the conflict that first appeared when we seemingly undifferentiatedly called for a movement in the name of women. So what I take from this is a radical understanding of how to envisage the nature of the transformative work for change 
agitated by the ever-emerging agitating wrongs and demonstrating disagreements that generates politics as new forms and new modes of subjectivization. This abolishes the idea that we can divide the political from the aesthetic, the active from the reflective, the social from the subjective. In a vocabulary I borrow from Jacques Ranciere, we can understand the process of democracy as an act of political subjectivization that disturbs the police order by polemically calling into question the aesthetic coordinates of perception, thought, and action. This is how, of course, art, politics, sex become part of feminism. This is not consensual. It is a condition, I quote, of contention that implements various forms of dissensus. And dissensus is a fissure in the kind of attempt to moderate, to organize social conflict in a kind of legislative way. And what we have to do instead is confront, I quote, the established framework of perception, thought, and action with the inadmissible, with a political subject, with a changed form of subjectivity that resists and also disturbs, and therefore also is a subject of desire. Now, in struggling, therefore, to refuse the negative force of familial or generational thinking and to foster this political dynamic of transgenerational transmission in Hannah Arendt's sense of sharing a love of a common world with a belief in the inevitable newness of the natality, the novelty of human beings ever creative as they come forward to change the world, how can we understand the role of feminist thinking in forging a democratic subjectivity? So by way of a slightly long conclusion, I want to introduce Susan Stewart Steinberg's fascinating reading of the political thought in psychoanalysis, in her reading of Anna Freud, the daughter of a famous father, whose task it was to institutionalize her father's intellectual legacy, not as Freudianism, but as psychoanalysis. Anna Freud was not a mother. She lived a long life in a long-term relationship with another woman. They both dedicated themselves to the repair of children whose world psyches were damaged by political violence, by war trauma, by separation and bereavement. And Anna Freud's achievement is defined by Susan Stewart as a politics, uh, uh, sorry, as impious fidelity. To understand this, we need an artwork and a digression into the politics of fidelity itself. Writing of the installation circa 1968 by, in 2004 by Mary Kelly, in which she reworked an iconic image of 1968 in the felt residue from a domestic tumble dryer and was animated by a pulse of light noise, Rosalind Deutsch writes, in her theater of not forgetting, a reference to the key idea of fidelity, Kelly used a material that serves the philosopher Alain Badiou as a metaphor for the event, light. The event, says Badiou, is like a flashing supplement that happens to a situation. It bursts, bursts forth as if into flame and gives off light, which disappears, leaving a trace in the situation, a kind of afterimage that refers back to the vanished event and guides the subject's fidelity. So the flash of the event leaves to a trace that creates an afterimage that guides she or he who would remain faithful to an event, an event that only becomes itself in those persistent acts of fidelity. And she who is faithful to that event becomes, through the continuous work with the event, what she, to make, she becomes what she becomes and the event itself becomes what it becomes. So far from feminism being something in the past, it is what we perpetually make it in a fidelity to an event of its traumatic shock. Another quotation. Both fidelity to the event and left melancholy remember the past and write history. But unlike triumphalist historical narratives in which emancipation leads to resolution, Kelly's history is written in the tense of the future anterior, an order of time in which reimagining never ends. Theorizing the future anterior as the time of personal history, Lacan once wrote, what is realized in my history is not the past definite of what was, since it is no more, and even the present perfect of what has been in what I am, but the future interior of what I shall have been for what I am in the process of becoming. <clears throat> 
For Freud, the significance of formative infancy lies in the unconscious archiving and its potential for traumatic return. Traumatic return, sorry. Flashing up in secondary instances which become the only actualized and always the belated sites of formative events that when they happen, happen too early to be understood and leave effective after images which then incite perpetual fidelity. Far from endlessly locating the present in causes locked in the past, the force of the past enters into the present which becomes the moment of the past in its realization linking instances in conjunctions that are potentially regressive or potentially and unpredictably transformative. So finally, Deutsch says this. Lacan's description of personal history recalls Walter Benjamin's philosophy of political history. The historian, as Benjamin fam famously wrote, does not reconstruct the past as it really was, but bringing the past and present into a constellation seizes hold of memory as it flashes up at a moment of danger. Kelly thus mixes Badiou and Benjamin, two philosophers of the flash and of revolutionary not forgetting. For love songs, the work you see there, the woman's liberation cannot be distinguished from the transformations it undergoes in the hands of a new generation, and perhaps most importantly, in both generations' fantasies. Now I find this formulation very helpful. Those who claim to know, have known the past cannot claim its truth for themselves. Its being is in the hands who, of those who make something of it afterwardly, in a movement of deferral and fidelity. Yet there is a traffic between different spots in time, a mingling of fantasies, projective and retrospective. Far from instituting the fam familial model of generations that supersede each other, we need to have a historical understanding of colliding temporalities and co-inhabited fantasies that are both alive at the same time, although starting from different experiences and places. The past is in part framed by fantasies of the past to which that gives rise. These fantasies are intergenerational, Oedipal inevitably, we're formed in that, but they can become politically transgenerational in the manner that Har Hannah Arendt proposed. They may be in conflict, but they are always doubled themselves, for each generation is always fantasizing about another's missing past. So let me now turn finally to Anna Freud and impious fidelity to close. Anna Freud talks about the problem of envy to get us closer to impious fidelity in politics. Two different kinds of affects, envy and anxiety, underpin the respective formations of femininity and masculinity, according to Anna's father, Freud, Sigmund Freud. The affect of envy, infamously associated with the hated concept of penis envy, the affect of envy, which is the fate of femininity's unhappy role in the patriarchal symbolic, can, however, I would contest, be productive and creative. Envy enables the feminine subject, or any other oppressed subject, to resist the status quo, to be perpetually unhappy with it, to want to be what she is told she is not, and to use the potentialities of cross-identification to have or even be what she wants. A certain kind of psychic flexibility, a kind of transgendered imagination becomes possible amongst the envious, when they turn it to political ends. On the other hand, I'm afraid to say, the typical masculine subject is frozen by anxiety because if he becomes other than he imagines himself to be, he might be subjected to loss or worse, mutilation. He would become something less, woman. Freud remarks, however, that this limits the masculine subject in that adopting, I'm quoting, a feminine attitude in men is actually an extremely valuable thing for many situations. Now, classical political theory considers politics as a place free from affect, for affect is considered in itself feminine and placed apart from the political. What Stuart Steinberg will argue is that which is exiled to the feminine, this affect, and particularly the affect of envy, is paradoxically the basis for the condition of modern democratic subjectivity. Quote, 
Freud's great contribution to political theory is to have reintroduced affect into the mechanisms of power, not simply as that which must be contained, but as the site where social and political relations originate. Freud posits that the origins of democratic subjecthood, as opposed to hierarchical subjecthood, that's to say hierarchical would be parents and children always seeking, as opposed to the democratic subjecthood, which is everybody's in the nursery together. So Freud posits that the origins of democratic subjecthood, which is modern subjecthood, one effect that he views as crucial for the social contract, envy. Envy lies at the root of both Freud's theory of democracy and his theory of gender construction. For envy engenders political subjectivity through a series of cross-identifications. Thus, in Freudian fantasy of the social contract, the male democratic subject, I will argue, is a woman who acts like a man, the feminist. Into this complex argument comes Anna Freud's own contribution. And her position is one who comes after the founding gestures of her father, who created new ways of thinking, subjectivity, and the political. Yet she had to negotiate effectively and intellectually some of the con contradictions and anxieties that arise from the challenge of fidelity. She had to secure the spirit of the creative initiating radical gesture when it became institutionalized, not merely as her father's work, but as psychoanalysis, as a historic event in the world. I'm shadowing this historical case of the issues af the po of politics, affect, institutionalization, and continuation with the as yet unthought memory or unwritten histories of feminism in which I find myself, like Lynn, complexly placed as a woman thinker of a certain age and a certain historical formation. Has feminism be inst been institutionalized th by those who behave merely as its rebellious daughters? And what is the fate of those who are imagined now as troubling mothers rather than merely older thinkers? Why do we write out stories in disabling displacement rather than creative agonism? How might we imagine ways of relating laterally and generationally beyond the Oedipalized and heterosexual family paradigm that at once rehearses the heteronormative modeling, modeling of sexual difference, but also theoretically and psycho psychically denies any politi politicizing or creative space, either to the maternal or to the filial feminine? Is all affect Oedipal in the last instance, or are there other resources in psychic life which we could mobilize for a politics that's not modeled on the Oedipal prefigurations of parental authority and catastrophically constituted sexual difference? I, are there ways to think women's political subjectivity that, involve, that involves willful transgendering as opposed to negative or positive idealization of an imagined good mother? Let us turn to one final return to Anna Freud. One way into the nexus of politics, sexual difference, and our affect is through Freud's relation to his daughter. Anna Freud, who became her father's contested successor, did so by becoming the carrier of a node of problems and anxieties within the psychoanalytical movement itself. Gender and feminine sexuality, the transformation of the envious child into a democratic subject, but above all, the handing down of authority and knowledge from one generation to the next. In some ways, we might hear the extraordinary parallels between the knot of tensions within the psychoanalytical movement and the knot of tensions within the feminist movement, which with psychoanalysis I would position as the twin, hence related, and perhaps warring, traumatic events of massive political significance to the human condition that took place in the 20th century. Both feminism and psychoanalysis were ruptured and reshaped by the 20th century's major events, the enactments of genocidal racism, the invention of a fundamentally dehumanizing political uh, anti-politics of totalitarianism, and the long and agonizing struggle against colonialism that produces decolonization and the post-colonial. What is feminism's relation to, debt to, forgotten or forgotten obligation to the memory and trauma of colonialism, the concentrationary and the genocidal? Was feminism an after-affect or after-effect of this potential destruction of humanity that must now engage in impious fidelity to its own evolving projects with an open and critical mind towards its endless virtuality? Yes, I've got to 
one sentence left, that remakes the legacies of the imperfect but shareable past a basis for continuous work in a direction that these of these flawed but create that these flawed but creative others began to plot out. Hence, I think we come together to think once again about art, politics, sex, and feminism. But these are the questions of life and human life and democratic life that feminism is still in the process of posing, not yet with answers, but with your help and continuation, there may be some. Thank you. Thanks for all those wise words, Griselda. And uh, it's lovely to be here in the Red Room, the Star Chamber at the Tate. So thanks to the talks organisers and to Verso for organising this and republishing my book. So to feminism and the politics of pleasure, which I talk about in Straight Sex. Following on from Griselda, agonism, challenge, contention, Start talking about sex today and soon, soon enough, trouble looms and looms large, unless we stick to jokes or gender cliché. Agreement is usually hard to find and not just amongst feminists, though we certainly face very special problems trying to tie the protean complexity and intangible nature of intimacy and desire to any sort of feminist sexual politics. This was never just a mother-daughter affair, though it's often enough presented itself as that. We challenged and we fought with each other all the time from day one, as straight, lesbian, black, Jewish, and any number of other identities um, came to the fore, particularly with the success of women's liberation. Although it wasn't in fact feminists, but Wilhelm Reich, who first talked about sexual politics, back in the 1930s, criticising the repressiveness of, the, of bourgeois sexual morality, which doubled as sexual hypocrisy. He talked about that while watching the rise of fascism in Europe and seeing, he thought, some ties between the two. His sex poll papers aimed to free sexuality from the constraints of religious moralism and compulsive patriarchal monogamy while seeing this as only achievable after the end of capitalist exploitation with the coming of socialism. Times change, and then again, as Griselda said, its traumas return. For certain, massive sexual hypocrisy and double standards, if not fortunately then, too much rising fascism, helped inaugurate women's liberation at the close of the 1960s. At long last, Talk of sexual liberation, not punitive moralism, was bubbling up everywhere, especially around women, young women, very young women often, suddenly apparently free to flaunt our sexuality as never before, though in a rather peculiarly childlike and frivolous way, it seemed. I arrived in London in 1970 when the optimistic, hedonistic, oh-so-resolutely youthful, oriented culture of swinging London was still evident everywhere. That teenager, Twiggy, right? Well, Twiggy, there she was, looking just like a child in adult drag, displayed mouth open, sucking her thumb, or riding her baby scooter. Had been lead, she'd been the leading fashion icon for the previous four years in the 1960s. Though she was now retiring, having reached the grand old age of 20. Thus, if to be young then was very heaven, it had many pitfalls for women, youth being so very fleeting. And women, above all, girls, needing to stay forever young. Keep young and beautiful, as Eddie Cantor once crooned. We'd soon know how much they meant it. For sure, Many of us young women then were eager to partake of the new sexual freedom that came along with the consumer-oriented swinging 60s, a time of full employment, increased wages, imagine all that, and by the close of the decade, for some of us, youthful rebellion. We took to the streets, or were more active between the sheets, and were more active between the sheets, 
liberated or partly so by the marketing of the oral contraceptive pill. Having sex and flaunting it rather than guiltily hiding it was the single main way some young women in the 1960s felt we were rebelling against parental and middle class norms. Thus, fashion entrepreneur Mary Quant, for instance, proclaimed in 1969, making lots of money as she was, now that there is the pill, women are the sex in charge. She's standing there defiantly with her legs apart. I'm very sexy, she's saying. I feel provocative, but you're going to have a job to get me. You've got to be jolly marvelous to attract me. Of course, she had to be a teenager. Well, I think Quant was wrong about most women's sexual confidence back then, including and perhaps especially teenagers. Whatever our youth, Bieber miniskirts or parted legs. For despite all the flaunting of young women's sexuality, the 1960s remained overall a quintessentially male decade. Once out of our teens, it was the association of woman with mother and domesticated conformity which the radical world I entered as a young woman abhorred. I was already 20 when I arrived here in London. The so-called angry young men the 60s celebrated were all tough, amoral, anarchic male heroes, like those in Alan Silito's Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, or crazy outsiders, as in the film Morgan, or else ethereal love objects, like Dylan's sad-eyed ladies waiting at home for Bob to return. Street fighting man, working class heroes were battling women and any constraints of domestic responsibility along with those other authorities. Moreover, those of us who were part of the radical left in student movements, civil rights and anti-Vietnam activities, especially at the end of the 1960s, confronted an even more explicit sexism in the underground press with its pinups and psychedelic porn, which was, can be seen especially in the May 68 graffiti, some of it now. Um, well, you can see this one, perhaps. Uh, it was something put out in May 68, um, where women very much remain the prey of those male sexual radicals. Some comrades from the occupation are going to come and fuck me violently. Judging by their practice, that is the violent fucking, presumably, their theories must be truly radical. Well, this was the sort of atmosphere then which would produce women's liberation. Um, Sheila Rowbottom, someone else whose work is um, being published in the Radical Thinkers series by um, <clears throat> Verso, was the only woman on Black Dwarf then, and she summed up much of the mood Oh, yes, we've got it. Much of the mood of the moment when um, she wrote in the essay in 1969, which was the first women's issue which Black Dwarf had contained. She wasn't allowed to edit it being a woman, but um, she was allowed to write a lot for it. And um, for once, she said the predictions of uh, this magazine came true. 1969 really was the year of the radical woman. And as she wrote there, men, you have nothing to lose. Men have nothing to lose but their chains. I won't read it all out, but she's saying you'll no longer have to um, uh, creep around sniggering at women, but you'll be able to have more open and loving and free relationships with women. That, I'm saying, was the mood that was present in that first surge of women's liberation at the close of the 1960s. And the first women's groups be began meeting just then in Britain in 1969. And women were very much wanting to talk about sexuality, but in all the ways missing from what was present in the underground, pre underground press, what was there in men's sniggering talk. What they wanted to talk about was the pain and anxiety still there over our fertility, and right to choose to have or not to have children, in our dislikes of the pin-up saturating the alternative press, in men's fears of women's growing independence, and particularly our sexual autonomy, and of course in problems around childcare. This was the mood that produced the first commercially successful British feminist magazine, Spare Rib, in 1972, 
It was both a product of the counterculture against, as well as a reaction against it, as Marsha Rowe, one of its first editors, uh, would later write. So as I concluded, describing this moment at the close of the 60s, um, in my um, opening chapter in Straight Sex, I say, saying yes to sex was still seen as a part of our liberation, but it had to be a feminist or liberated type of sexuality with or without a man. Thus, women of my generation moved on from seeing sex as liberation to seeking liberated sex. So then I had some pictures of us. What? All right, there. That was the first Women's Liberation March I attended. Okay. <laughs> Liberated sex, there's the difficulty. How on earth, really, were we going to talk about that? Were we going to find that? It seemed to grow harder, not easier, as the years passed. Women's liberation began confidently enough. Think clitoris was how the well-known American feminist Alex Kate Shulman summed up feminist thinking on sexuality in 1971. As again, I noted in my second chapter, The Liberated Orgasm. In her popular book, Burning Questions of 1978, Shulman had one young feminist mention the three non-negotiable no, non conditions for good sex. Plenty of dope, three hours minimum, and cunnilingus. <laughs> so that was her notion of liberated sex. Moreover, Despite the fearful impediments she herself has faced, Shulman remained largely optimistic and po positive about her loving relationships with men ever since, despite her late husband um, <coughs> um, getting early onset dementia. And this, even though she would later write of attending a feminist meeting at the close of the 1970s, where all agreed that sex had changed for them, often for the better, more orgasms, for instance. Um, but nevertheless, they were often unhappy in love. So feminists 40 years ago were also especially skeptical about the idea of true romance, seeing it as wedded literally to men's power in those patriarchal nuclear families we'd been trying to escape from. Many of us were searching for alternatives. However, for many feminists, that first flush of feminist confidence in building a new world closer to our heart's desire, whether in the office, the kitchen, or the bedroom, was stifled by many things, but especially by rising awareness of the prevalence of men's violence against and sexual coercion of women. It was also weakened when we observed the abiding resilience of the phallocentric or male-centered nature of almost all our images and iconography of sex, even once we got rid of the blatant pinups in left publications. And it was hard to think outside of these traditional framings, however much we urgently tried to rethink and refashion them and introduce new words. And then again, any simple feminist search for independence, parity, and control in our relationships with men came up against something else, which is the inescapable contrariness of sexual passion. Like it or not, and we didn't, some level of confusion and contention was quite inevitable if straight women were to wade our way through the sea of sexual contradictions we seemed to face. It would lead at least some feminists, especially here in the UK, to turn to psychoanalysis in the footsteps of Juliet Mitchell as we began to explore sexuality as a crucible of contradictions and misunderstandings, especially between men and women. I joined that trend. Juliet Mitchell, whose first feminist text is also being reissued in this series, this Verso series, expressed some of this when she was interviewed by Spare Rib in the early 1980s, discussing the study group she attended addressing sexuality and sexual difference. A sort of panic starts in the mind, she said, 
We found when we go to talk about it, we just don't know what sexuality is anymore. How difficult is this? How difficult it is if we're not sure anymore quite how to talk about sexuality and our own desires when the world at large likes to pretend it knows all too much about what sex is, who should practice it and how. This is all the more crudely evident in the ever-expanding sexual marketplace, in the commodification of sexuality and bodies and media fashions and, fixa and fixations targeting precisely sexual fears and longings. Moreover, things didn't get easier for us as the conflicts within feminism heightened during the so-called sex wars of the 1980s. Great, thank you. Leading feminist figures fought over the very meaning of feminism, some wanting to place heterosexuality at the core of feminist politics, reducing men's power overall to male sexuality and then reducing male sexuality to violence. That's Catherine McKinnon, like her fellow American anti-pornography campaigner Andrea Dworkin, insisted that there was no way even to imagine any passionate harmony between women and men in the current terms of intimacy. What looks like love and romance in the liberal view, Catherine McKinnon wrote, looks a lot like hatred and torture in the feminist view. Given the still prevailing iconography of straight sex, some found their views persuasive. And although proposed by a minority of revolutionary feminists, rows over the primacy to be given to men's violence against women as the, not a, but the overriding cause of women's subordination was what dealt the death knell to any future annual gatherings of women's liberation in Leeds in 1977. Giving up fucking for a woman is about taking your politics seriously, they argued. Many of us disagreed, but we did stop talking about sexual pleasure if we were straight women. And it's certainly true that a bleaker climate was beginning to undermine all forms of radical politics in the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher, both feminism and the left. There were also, these were also the years when HIV and AIDS began to return fear and danger to sexual arenas, especially for gay men. And also when the serial sex murder, murderer, Peter Sutcliffe, was roaming the streets in and around Leeds. For over a decade, he murdered women on the streets and the police were completely unable to find him despite many people pointing directly to him, but he didn't fit the police's, police's notion of who was a murderer because he was a married man and looked rather like them. Thus, as the sex wars raged during the 1980s, it seemed <coughs> um, too dangerous even to discuss the ways in which sexuality itself, both women's and men's, were often steeped in fantasies involving the eroticization of power and submission. Instead, and importantly, feminist research focused on issues of safety, especially for young women, which I um, report in that uh, feminist research on sexuality. That comes from a book edited by um, Janet Holland called The Man in the Head, saying that young women don't easily have a language around to talk about sex that helps them in their relationships with men. As well, book after book was published on the cultural scaffolding of rape, the extent of rape and the way in which coerciveness seems to be tied in some way to normative notions of masculinity, assertiveness, men being, um, <coughs> being forced by their uh, huge sexual desires into um, um, needing to assert themselves in um, sexual relations with, with women. Meanwhile, though, while this very negative um, trend, well, or pessimistic trend on uh, paying attention to rape and violence and the difficulties of transforming the language of sexuality seem to be totally surrounding the heterosexual world, talk of desire and pleasure reappeared 
but it reappeared somewhere else with the renewed, renewed surge of confidence in defiant dissident sexuality in gay and lesbian writing from the 1990s. The vigour and joys, so I could have another um, slide now, the vigour and joys of queer theory raced in onto academic platforms throughout the 1990s, aligned at least for a while with the noisy protests of ACT UP and other activist campaigns demanding government action around HIV and AIDS. I can remember when the only big demonstrations we went on in the 1990s seemed to be all around, and importantly around, HIV and AIDS, and all the writing on sex was being written in particular by gay men and also by some so-called sex-positive lesbians. This time, citing the words of Judith Butler, Eve Sedgwick, Leo Bassani and others, queer scholars and activists could draw upon the lifelong legacies of Freud's polymorphously bisexual infant, ignoring all the ways, or rejecting rather, all the ways in which psychoanalysis had been used normatively um, by certain psychoanalytic writers. And this use of Freud was added to Michel Foucault's questioning of there being any stable or unitary notion of sexuality at all, whatever our gender or sexual orientation. Pleasure has no passport, no identity card, Foucault said, hoping to de detach the body and its pleasures from our understandings of gender and anatomical difference. Um, that was um, slide 13. I don't know if that was... Um, oh, yes, we're not quite up to that yet, but we're getting close to it. <laughs> it's drawing upon both... It was drawing upon both psychoanalytic theory and critical theory that I dared in straight sex to return again to all those questions we had raised in the first passionate years of women's liberation, to hope again to develop a positive sexual politics that could include women, all women, straight and lesbian, as well as gay men and any other forms of sexual dissidence. <clears throat> Given all we know about the easily shaken yet solid phallocentrism of the symbolic order, all we know about the androcentrism of discourse around sexuality and subjectivity, Given what we had learned about the problematic ways of men determined to shore up their entitlements to the insecure mantle of masculinity, how was it going to be possible, I ask in straight sex, to develop loving, pleasurable and responsible sexual relationships um, around heterosexuality or indeed any form of sexuality? Well... One begins, of course, by questioning, not by affirming, as I saw McKinnon and Dworkin and certain um, radical feminists as doing, by questioning rather than affirming all the traditional assumptions around gender and around the absurd active-passive divide that constructs what Judith Butler called the heterosexual matrix. It is desire itself, it is desire itself which threatens um, <clears throat> to render any one of us helpless, whether man or woman, um, however fragile or secure our hold on power elsewhere and whatever our gender or sexual orientation. Indeed, what happens in actual consensual sex I suggest in straight sex, looking at fiction, looking at poetry, looking indeed at, at, at clinical accounts of just all that we can find about the actual nature of sexual interactions. What we find is that they don't collapse down into that binary of male, female, active, passive, everything fitting together in that normative way. In love relations, in sexual relationships of any, uh, in passionate sexual relationships, we are all vulnerable. As Judith Butler says in Undoing Gender, 
addressing the perils of desire. Yes, we're up to the perils of desire. Let's face it. We're all undone by each other. And if we're not, we're missing something. If we're not, it's not such an exciting and passionate thing. After all, if we don't feel endangered by the potential loss of um, <clears throat> the person we desire. If this seems so clearly the case with grief, it is only because it was already the case with desire. Okay, I am finishing in two minutes. In an earlier brief meditation on the risks of love, she suggests, love is not a state, a feeling, a disposition, but an exchange, uneven, fraught with history, with ghosts, with longings, that are more or less legible to those who try to see one another with their own faulty vision. And that's what I feel I pick up when I read anything that actually turns me on around desire or sexuality. For sure, we all need to face up to the strange unruliness of desire. Surely, for instance, it's not only sex workers who know that, that what men want as often as not is to be sexually passive. Of course, what men do not want is for women, and even less, for other men to know this. That's the sort of thing I write a lot about in straight sex. Knowing this, however, is one thing, and confronting violence in the world at large, a significant part of it, but only a part of it, men's abuse and sexual coercion of women is another thing. I don't ever want to ignore the latter, just as, like Joan Nessel, I don't ever want to forget the former. It is possible to play with power in fantasy, in erotic relationships, although that was once uh, forbidden to us. It is possible. Um, and that does not need to interfere with our ways of fighting the systemic violence in human institutions and human relationships so evident everywhere, near and far. Indeed, the latter is such hard work. Sometimes we need some escape from it in perhaps our incorrect uh, fantasies. And if we don't have some idea of the difference between the psychic life of desire and the routine endemic social violence all around us, will not really know much about either, about either sexuality or about violence. That's what I point out in straight sex. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. Hi, I'm Sonia, <laughs> by the way. Um, many apologies for running late, not being able to introduce properly. Um, so when I was, when I was asked to, um, whether I might consider chairing this session, um, it was one of three or four requests that I was getting in the same week oh. about feminism, about desire, um, about radical thinking. And it made me wonder what's going on. Why now? What, it, what is it that, why, why is this question being kind of thought through now? Um, so I wanted to start to, to, for us to kind of think about that. And then the other thing that um, <coughs> occurred to me when, specifically with, 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 this, with this talk um, uh, and discussion, the question of heterosexual sex, and I frowned. Yeah and thought, oh no, why would we be doing that? Um, and I mean, it set up all sorts of questions for me, thinking about how the debates, why, why is it so difficult to talk about heterosexual sex as a feminist? Um, and I, I, I think we should really maybe talk about some of those things. Um, history. With both, of, with both of your talks, the question of history looms very large, and I was very taken, Griselda, with 
this question about fidelity and loyalty and faithfulness to the past in some way and wonder what does that mean for us now? You know, you, you talk about almost, almost like the past is an archive in which we can project into the future and I kind of wonder what, what future you, you, you can see there. Is that a good start, do you think? Do you want to start? You start. I start. Oh, why now? You know, there's been a really interesting resurgence of feminism for about 10 years, for instance, in London in 2004, so exactly 10 years, the radical fem the feminists in London, the feminists in London started to meet. And why I made that slip of radical feminism, actually, was because Finn Mackay, who's just written a book on radical feminism, was a key voice in that and a key mover and shaker in getting that going. And the main thing she wanted to revive and did revive successfully and importantly was um, the Take Back the Night marches. And that had been very controversial within um, uh, late 70s, 80s feminism for many different reasons. But you know, what we have seen is a huge, I don't know if it's an, upsur uh, an upsurge, but what we see is more violence everywhere with mm. more war, um, uh, more ethnic conflict, and, and inevitably accompanying that. Uh, more violence against women. More violence by men against men, obviously, as well, but more violence against women. So, you know, we've all become aware once more, if we ever forgot, of the extent of rape and sexual violence. And uh, so I think that's one reason to be asking all these questions, and also one reason, I hope, um, that as I ended, we're still going to be able to try and separate talk about desire and the possibility for loving relations between people of whatever nature from what we need to confront, which is violence on our doorstep and further afield. So I, I think that um, the issue is very much there in the air and so are all the old conflicts around the issue, which is why for me we need to talk about straight sex still mm -hmm. and importantly. I'd like to take that up, but in a slightly different direction. I agree with a lot of what, what Lynn is saying, and I think it's an absolutely spot-on question. My sense of it and why I was kind of formulating it in the way that I was formulating it is sort of two sides of it. One is that it's as if it's not that people are going back to feminism, but in some sense it becomes a different kind of resource because I think what women of the generation of the time today are meeting is a different configuration of some of those similar issues. So it's not a continuity, there's something else. Um, and I find the conversations that I have, particularly with young artists and young art historians and students, sort of trying to thinking about it at the f form of education that I encounter, which is that we, we kind of dodge around things because I'm sort of aware that the nature of the sexuality, the nature of the bodies, the predominant hairlessness of women, you know, the whole, uh, these kinds of shifts, um, you know, it's difficult to have that conversation in one sense, you know, could you just tell me what's going on here? But it does seem to me that the questions are um, a new configuration of issues around desire, agency, safety, and the question of men and women um, that draw back to the archive, is what you're sort of suggesting. Does this offer us something? And yet, at the same time, I think the situation is extremely different. I think the issue of the contemporary media, I think the issue precisely because of media and pornography, that the kinds of issues against which we protest when you show the images were mild, right? I mean, I think in a sense some of the things obviously were more than that, but I mean, certainly you didn't have the level of a pornographic representation of sexuality as normal, right? You, you'd go and hunt it out. You might, you know, buy some copies of Penthouse and sort of show pictures to your students, etc. But that was about as far as it, not until Andrea walked, walk in, you know, began to publish some of the, you know, still relatively my hardcore, hardcore um, porn. And that, you know, issue. You know, I can't read her because she seems so uh, into it all. Well, exactly. But that's so my feeling, which is why now I think it's not, it's come back. Mm 
but I think a reconfiguration of some of the challenges are faced, and this is why I'm sort of stressing how would you build a conversation between the historical moment that led to one articulation of the debate about women's safety and sexuality and now. So, I actually, I kept writing the word safe and what, mm. what is safe and what is unsafe. Mm. Um, what, is it, what is it that we don't feel we're able to say or able to do or able to visualise? I mean, one of the things that I was really very curious about is what kinds of imagery you would both use for your talks. And I wondered to what extent um, the question of desire and visuality for women is a topic now, is a, dis is a point of discussion now, in a way that I'm thinking back to the 80s, where it, there was a lot of refusal. It's like you, you're, either, you're either in one camp or you're in another camp, someone like Dworkin, for instance. Um, and what is it possible to visualise now is what I, I was kind of, what's safe and what's unsafe now. And I'm talking about beyond the 90s moment of the bad girl. You know, we saw a lot of exhibitions in the 90s of bad girls, and it's like, well, actually, is there, is there no other space but the good and the bad, or the safe and the unsafe? I think it comes to, um, I mean, I think it's a very good question, and, you know, there is one line that women, particularly young women, are worse off today because it's thought there's more sexism in the media, um, women's bodies are sexualized even younger, and... I've often found when talking to audiences, particularly <laughs> older women, raise this a lot. Not so much young women, actually, <laughs> unless they're the feminists I recognise, but older women raise this about, you know, how actually usually criticising young women, you know, how they're all displaying their bodies and wearing high heels and, you know, exposing all their flesh. <laughs> and uh, so I have thought very much about the question whether young women are actually worse off today and I absolutely don't think they are first of all because we have such a language of safe and responsible sexuality that came out of the 1980s and 1990s and discussions around um, HIV and AIDS because surely in sex education today people are talking about safe responsible sexual engagement, at least I hope they are, not in the US where they deny, uh, <coughs> won't allow any sex education, but in our schools, I hope and I think, because sometimes I'm asked along there, there is more talk about that. And so, you know, the, you can't generalise at all about what the situation would be for young women if we're talking about young women, but I do um, think... The, you're not just talking about young women. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about now. Yes. So that's all mm. of us that are in. I think we have a larger now. language net to draw upon in trying to discuss it more openly. That's the main thing I'd say. Although, of course, everyday routine sexism is everywhere. But we have these words. We know what sexism is. We can at least discuss it. But I think I think your question, Sonia, is really interesting about absolutely the image and. The thing is, I think that for me is there's a difference between what is what we're trying to talk about in terms of sex, sexualization. When we talk about um, girls and young women and you know the whole kind of media over sexualizing, but we we're not specifying what concept of sexuality that represents compared to what it seems to me that the feminist discourse was actually to say, what is it? What would happen if we actually try to rethink sexuality from a point of view in which is not kind of compulsory heterosexuality for the reproduction of species? You know, we've got the wonderful article by Gail Rubin, which you know argues that the actual repression of women's sexuality is central to constructing the notion of men and women, and the sort of you know the family is the central premise because you have to f effectively take the sexual agency away from one part of the sort of sexualized human condition and say you don't have the right to choose your partners and so, so in one sense if you go back to your things the historic trauma of of the women's movement made possible because of the contraceptive pill was to say okay what is women's sexual agency outside of the notion of the vamp who always gets killed off or disfigured or has to be you know married off you know movies how many movies do you watch you know, does a sort of an attempt at it and then you're either dead 
or married as a solution to the, the thing. So what is it? And of course, we haven't really thought about this question about, you know, uh, the whole kind of related to the question of uh, people claiming right to sexual agency outside of the framework of being sexualized, i.e., you know, disabled people who are rep not represented in the classic concepts or older people or, you know, all sorts of elements of that. So it seems to me that we actually haven't got very far with a certain thing. We've been sort of brought back and trapped in a certain kind it's of image. And I think your, your point yeah. about how, what would be the images of it. So, I mean, there's a certain amount of debate in kind of feminist art and film theory, which would be something like, you know, that actually this, um, you know, sh lifting your skirts and saying, you know, I'm sexual because I'm showing you my body is actually not a signifier of, of you know, women's sexuality, that it might be displaced into um, rhythm and time and duration and different ways of signifying it. And that's a certain amount of artistic exploration around how you would convey an, you know, kind of a feminine erotics that isn't then either straight or, or queer, but is what is it to be a sexual agent rather than to be caught in saying I'm sexually attracted to X or I do Y? You know, what, what is a sexual being? In, in, in the feminine, I, and I think that's still an open question. Can I make one small point, though? <coughs> when we were young, neither feminists nor anyone else ever raised the question of sexuality in relation to disability or what we now call slow learners, we know what well, they used to call them, or, um, <coughs> or older women. We just didn't. We assumed that it disappeared. You know, and that is being raised, you know, by artists in films, in writing, like my last book, um, um, uh, Out of Time. And so, again, you know, I'd say we have more language to discuss it. We have more images to look at, even though, of course, you know, we've got everywhere to go. We've got so far to go. But I, I see starts, that, beginnings that make me feel more optimistic, that we can continue the discussion that's still, it's always just beginning, as I say, you know, where sex is, their trouble looms. And, and so we just have to keep working at it, I think, and not close it down, that's all. I think that might be a good moment in which to kind of open up the discussion and see what, oh, straight away. Can we get a microphone here in the, one, two, three, four. Hi. Um, thanks for the really interesting provocations. Um, one thing that I'm really fascinated by as well is this um, notion of the tran transgenerational conversations and also mm -hmm. um, the ways in which these kinds of discourses are re-articulated over time. And one thing that I've, I've not yet quite um, found out for myself is why particularly um, feminists emerging in the 1970s, um, why for them, uh, why psychoanalysis? Because I think that's uh, something that's changing over time and it's not something that... Um, I use, for example, and um, I think it's uh, it's something that you see less in in, in women emerging post seventies and eighties, particularly. So, why psychoanalysis? Uh, are you taking it separate questions? Do you want to answer that first? Um, I'm quite happy to answer that. I mean, um, in in the book I edited called Psychoanalysis Psychoanalysis and the Image. Um, transdisciplinary feminist perspectives, um, exactly that question, why? And I mean, there's, there's a range of answers offered to people, right? I mean, but this, in one sense is, as I was trying to suggest, I, I twin it with, with feminism and since there's a particular kind of major event of the 20th century that asks a certain question. It's the discourse in which you can pose questions in which the object is subjectivity, fantasy, desire, right? You're not gonna find that in Marx. You're not gonna find that in Durkheim in a certain sense. That's, that's the, the crucial thing. Um, certainly as far as the question of the visual and the image, it's also one of the most powerful discourses because it poses the question of why we look what we look for. What is the sort of the, the eroticization of the field of vision as well as the sort of the anguish of our sense that we're looking for something in art. So I mean, it has a huge implication for 
what, why we even look and what we're looking for and what the image does for us. So, I mean, I think those are just two simple bases that I, I see as, you know, impossible to proceed without, but it's not exclusive. I think that you're absolutely right to raise it as a generational issue, actually. And there's so much more to say about uh, transgenerational conversation, and it's so wonderful to see people of different ages here listening to us old ladies. Uh, just older and, thinkers, older thinkers. And, um, That's what I have a character category. <laughs> you know, when we wanted to complicate our thinking about sexuality, because in the very beginning, women, feminists were still reading Masters and Johnson, and that's where we got notions of the liberated orgasm, and, you know, you just had to, as I said, have, uh, you know, basically more foreplay and so on, and more cunnilingus, and everything would be all right. You know, you had to get the techniques right. And we knew that just really wasn't enough. We might be having more sex and even having more orgasms, but we were still unhappy in love. Uh, and, you know, before Foucault was around and before we were reading critical theory, we were aware of psychoanalysis and some of the complexities that Freud brought in. And in particular, I mean, Juliet Mitchell from the 60s, you know, was absolutely reading Freud, putting it out there. Her, her book, Psychoanalysis and Feminism, published in 1974, you know, is introducing us, if we hadn't already been introduced to Freud, some of us like me had been aware of Reich and so on. You know, psychoanalysis was in the air, both to be attacked by feminists uh, and also as a possible resource. And that's always been so, actually. Feminism and Freud have always been somewhere on each other's minds. You know, Juliet Mitchell says when she went to the States, People were throwing darts at um, uh, boards with Freud's head on them. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, other people like her were using Freud. Emma Goldman was the same. Emma Goldman, back in the 20s, when Freud went to the US, the 20s, maybe the 10s, 10, sorry, um, said, you know, a genius is giant has come to talk to us, you know, whereas others uh, thought that he was diverting the struggle away from uh, women's needs. So. <coughs> women's needs for emancipation. So there was always that tension. Now, I think you're right that by the 90s, and particularly with Foucault and queer and his understanding about that, a lot of people felt that they could get enough questioning of sexuality and, and, and its complexities um, <coughs> and, and confusions and contradictions from Foucault. But those of us who had been uh, uh, earlier reading Freud felt, no, there's something more around the affect tied to our thoughts here that take us back to psychoanalysis. But I think there is a, a slight generational, you know, it's fashions in academia, fashions in academia as well. And, and critical theory did tend partially to sweep over uh, psychoanalysis, although people like Judith Butler, particularly via people like Laplanche, you know, not to mention Griselda and others, even I try to try and bring them together, you know, try to bring together critical theory and psychoanalysis. But I'd say that the fashion did swing more away from psychoanalysis, knowing how normative its uses have often been at the same time, you know, as other people like Jonathan Dollymore, unlike Alan Sinfield, thinking that, you know, there were uses, good uses you could make of psychoanalysis. So, you know, it's for you all to think about that further. Thank you so much. I learned so much from your presentations. Um, Can you put it close to your mouth? Yes. I, I don't think, I can't think of um, a discourse that would take us to an understanding of, for example, the perverse enjoyment foreclosed in the violence that's done in the name of ideals other than through a psychoanalysis, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, that the violence that remains invariant historically and geographically, whether it's against women or humans against humans or subjects against subjects, is mostly done in the name of ideals. Mm. And the horizon of that, the most extreme ethical horizon, has to be thought, perhaps in relation to a kind of perverse unconscious enjoyment, mm. at the same time that one's apparently following ideals. Mm -hmm. And I can't see how one can come to an understanding of what I've just said without psychoanalysis for instance. And I think that has insisted, say, for instance, in the work of, say, Slavoj Žižek. <laughs> yes. You know, 
I think that is something that he's continued to really work on. Um, that's the one question, and then if I can, if you don't mind me, sort of coming in with something else. Um, recently, I went to a, an extraordinary debate um, where two position papers were given by the by Catherine Malibu. I've actually we've talked about this in the last week, Alan. Uh, Catherine Malibu talking from a position of cognitive and um, um, cognitive and neurological epigenesis. epigenesis. Um, <clears throat> arguing that the subject is being profoundly deconstructed and that psychoanalysis is completely obsolete. And then psychoanalysts arguing, even those that acknowledge the importance of the new work in cognitive and neurological sciences, acknowledge that really the unconscious is, is in a process of a demise. The unconscious as we know it is, is no longer the same. And there are new bodies and new symptoms. And we have to rethink everything in relation to all the work that's going on with the human, post-human, non-human kind of question in relation to the Anthropocene and the future. So I just wonder whether you, you know, this seems, in terms of this transgenerational conversation, this seems to be a point of, a contemporary point that I think is quite important and I wonder what your take on this might be. Can I, can I say something? Yes. To, I mean, I, when I said, you know, what does an audience want, there was a kind of no reaction in the audience. And I was absolutely perplexed. I thought, they're going to get that. You still don't get it, do you? You're sort of all looking at me like this as if I'm talking, you know. But I mean, it's, you know, it's the classic Freudian question. What, what does a woman want? What do you want? And the central question that psychoanalysis poses is to say, wait a minute, you know, relating to your question of ideas, what... What is driving you, okay? What is this other dimension that's driving you? And whether or not psychoanalysis is proven to be um, displaceable by some kind of you know, neurological chemical explanation, which I don't think it is, it, it, the question is the one we have to ask because it's the question that ultimately becomes ethical and political. Now, Freud was a neuroscientist and he always assumed, because there isn't a god and there isn't some kind of weird thing, you know, there's a little man in the head sort of operating the unconscious, it's got to be explicable, right? It has to be something that has a, a material neurological basis, all of what is this going on here. But one of the effects of the neurological act activity is the nature of the thought and this possibility of being divided against yourself and asking thought. Now, at no level can we get rid of the question of an unconscious either individually, because it's the ethical question, what do I want? What am I not seeing? What can't I hear? What am I failing in the sort of projection of myself not to recognize with the, with the other? And also, in one sense, it's the political unconscious. Right? There's no evidence that I can see that we cannot, we can do without the notion of being endlessly vigilant about what is really happening that we are not in control of that is maintaining, you know, structures of racism, structures of sexism, st you know, structures of, you know, certain kinds of violence. They happen all the time, structurally. And that's one of the, th the legacies of the psychoanalytical mode of inquiry. So I ask all the post-humanists and the humanists and the people who want to kind of dissolve the subject, what do you want? Why, why is this happening to us now? Now, it may be that they're really the hottest shit in town and I'm just an old, you know, you know dinosaur worrying away about things that belong in the 20th century, but the kind of question that I can pose from that moment of the 20th century is, what are we rushing headlong into? Why is academic life and cultural life so fashion conscious that we think, well, this is over, let's have something new. We were a bit humanist, now we'll be a bit post-human. What's, what's at stake here, right? I'm happy with people loving their dogs, absolutely keen with species being and all the rest of etc. But in a world in which we have not been able to secure the safety you know, of the millions of people on this earth from physical immiseration, from psychological immiseration, from the continuing obscenity of the state that we live in,
in relation to the majority of people on this planet. Please could we just hang on to this question about who is doing what and why with some terms. So I see, for me, psychoanalysis is entirely part of the problem of the political because we cannot um, you know, indulge ourselves in that um, you know, pursuit of something that, of pleasure, whatever, etc., which doesn't hold on to this ethical question about both what we said, the sort of the, the violence, and that's why I was putting such a stress on the question of how do we produce a democratic subjectivity, right? We can't get ourselves to want to desire the well-being of our, whether it's the dogs, or but I'm particularly interested in the human beings, etc. I do see this whole drive to somehow make us think about neurological stuff and dissolve the human ethical political subject as an extremely problematic direction, even though the science may be right, and even though it might be extremely interesting, for we could get insight, and Freud would always be with you, let's understand how the mind works. I mean, when he wrote The Theory of Sexuality in 1905, he said, I know they'll find something which explains the, the, the switch. And five months after he published The Theory of Sexuality, the first lecture was given when they identified hormones, which are the chemical <coughs> messengers, right? He always knew the science would explain it, but not what it means at the level of human, you know, agency, subjectivity. And that's, I think, the, still the tension for me, which is, again, posed deeply by feminism. I don't think uh, we're all academics in the audience, so it might be nice to hear from some who aren't. But, I mean, it's absolutely true that as academics, we're always in danger of being caught in yesterday's fashions and, um, you know, hobbling around in uh, the wrong theoretical attire. Um, what I find interesting is at present, even in Catherine Malibu and other people, the idea seems to be, and was certainly present in Freud, that one day neurology, the brain, would have the answers to our questions. I think exactly the opposite. I don't think that psychoanalysis so much needs to rely upon what's coming out of neurology. I think that whatever is coming out of neurology will remain absolutely meaningless blather without a language to talk about affect and emotion, which comes, of course, not just from psychoanalysis. It only comes from psychoanalysis insofar as it's there in the case studies and so on. It comes from literature. It comes from, you know, how on earth we can find a language rich enough to embrace confusion and contradiction and so on. And so, of course, Zizek's writing on the perverse enjoyment of pleasure uh, and relating it to... Um, um, you know, the appalling violence in the world today is very important. But, I mean, of course, you couldn't get anywhere near that, could you, from neurology or anything like that or brain science. You know, you, you have to keep enriching your language in thinking about how to embrace complexity, contradiction, confusion, how to assert opposing things at once and so on. That's all I'll say for now. I'm aware that it's now eight o'clock. Oh, but only. We've got one. We've got. Perhaps we've we got have room a round up of questions. Yes, maybe we can have just or comments. A, or comments. I have an or, answer. I want to answer one of the questions you put, but I'll wait okay. to see if we have any others. Do we have any other questions, comments? There's one at the back there. Oh, great. It's always front, back, front, back, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Racing around. Hello, thank, um, thank you very much <laughs> for the, the opportunity to ask a question or um, to actually put forward a, a statement. Um, I heard uh, you, the ladies, um, earlier on talking about how the kind of re-emergence of uh, the thought around feminism and, and, and art, sex and politics. Can and, you talk um, a bit more slowly and loudly? I'm finding hard to hear. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, it's probably also an accent thing. Um, Surely, uh, one of the one of the kind of principal reasons why uh, there's a, a kind of re-emergence of thought around feminism, kind of, um, is the is the internet and the and the, and the access to um, thinking and, uh, and 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 writers out there. I know certainly when I was doing my art degree many many years ago, 
um, I only really had access to uh, certain writers and, and kind of libraries and, and women who were actually writing about feminism and sexuality. Whereas these days, um, you only need to go onto Twitter and in one day you can massively educate yourself on um, all of the thinkers that are out there, both currently and in the past. Um, I just wanted to ask what um, your thoughts were on um, kind of intersectional thinking and um, kind of how that is, relates to feminism and certainly um, sex and, and politics and art. Okay. Um, yes. You know, I'm not quite as convinced by everybody else about the power of the internet, partly because we use it too. We have all our blogs and there's loads of feminist blogs out there. Of course, we're not mainstreamed in the same way the media doesn't take up what we say, but we do use it. And I think about the everyday scorn and jokes and everything about women from my childhood. You know, my father was a doctor and when a woman gave birth to a girl, he'd say, better luck next time. He thought that was a terrific joke. And I mean, there were jokes everywhere on, you know, uh, Jokes and songs, you know, about killing your wife and then you marry the next one and long for the old one again. I mean, there's, you know, misogyny can be easily expressed in many forms. And so I think that we can be actually um, overwhelmed by the sexism of the visual and forget, you know, the impact of just everyday hideous misogyny just in jokes and discussion. That was one thing. But about the intersectional, I was worrying, of course, thinking... I should talk about race and class, and it's so hard to do that in relation to sexuality. I mean, it's so hard because it's complicated enough to talk about it all, but to talk about the ways in which working class bodies, black bodies, have always been sexualized in the most demeaning of ways, you know, and to say we can't possibly have an emancipatory language of sex without taking on board you know, the continuing effects of racism and the, and, but the complexities of racism, the way in which, you know, the um, perverse Jewish body, the Svengali, is different from um, the um, primitive manual mean, menial body which the um, African body was seen as. Oh, you know, all this has to be tackled, um, as well as, you know, working-class women as... as, uh, as um, <coughs> who had to uh, engage in uh, prostitution. Um, well, maybe some of them chose to, but I would say on the whole they had to. Um, you know, their bodies were, you know, it, they could be basically murdered with impunity. Still, in the 1980s, when Peter Sutcliffe was murdering women on the stu streets, the police said, he's made a mistake. You know, he's murdered an innocent woman. He didn't murder a prostitute. He murdered a woman who wasn't a prostitute. So, you know, that all, every possible hierarchy intersects with the demeaning and degrading language of sex. So that absolutely all has to be in there. Can I, can I, can I also make a plea then for, you know, because one of the things that I... I, I, I <coughs> kept thinking about in both of your talks is yes we live with the structures of those mm -hmm. things but we also try to maneuver mm -hmm. through around mm -hmm. bypass mm -hmm. and for me I some know. of the some of the radicalism of how you negotiate those structures mm -hmm. we also have to talk about and, and speak of well, what strategies might we be employing and I think there wasn't you know from in terms of my own involvement in, in, in feminist and black debates, was well, what other images can we possibly find? What other images? Without there being a, a kind of regime in which... We probably won't agree. Of course we won't. <laughs> and some people will see this as an empowering image, say, of a black woman or a working class woman, and other people will say, no, that's a demeaning image. Yeah. But, that, <laughs> but, but that we can fight over yes, the possibility yes. of what yes. something can be. Absolutely, yes not just how we live within a structure, mm. but how we move beyond that Absolutely. structure. And, I, you know, and that's what I would like to make a plea for here, and that's what I feel the question of the radical and the political is about trying to find a, another route through which to express something that we don't feel is being expressed. Absolutely. I'd like to underline that because I, I just think, I mean... The central point of the first book that Rosie Parker and I wrote when we tried to think about which, which, which was to say 
Artists who are women negotiate their situation and they produce as much because of as despite their differential position. So it's not to say that they were oppressed and now they're free, but everybody negotiates and the negotiation is the complexity of artists thinking, working with materials, working with situations, and that's not predictable. You have to read each instance and you have to allow it. And I think that's the point when you were saying, what, what's my sense of the future? It's that um, I'm, I'm you know, arguing this notion of, in, you know, not feminism as a past that's coming back, but that feminism as a virtuality, that's to say some element of what it promises, or potentially we can even imagine, gets realized at certain points out of certain historical situations, and people do certain things with it, and then, but that doesn't exhaust it. So it's not to be confined to what it was, it's possibly that that was just one way that it got actualized under the pressures of both as you've done it, the 60s and 70s. And therefore, there was a kind of debate at that point which produced this notion of what would be a good image and a bad image. And I know I participated by that. And I'm, you know, times, um, you know, not appalled or ashamed, but in a sense, but it's typical because, you know, when I started writing, a, there was nothing, you know, I was just a graduate student, you know, and we just thought we could say what we liked, right? We said, we said all sorts of things, and now it says, you know, Griselda Pollock said, and I said, well, you know, I was like 23 or 24, and there was nothing, you know, there were no references. We just made these you know, big statements, and then you come back and you say, okay, no, no, it's not quite right like this. It's got to be more complicated, and, you know, people bashed us and argued and said, you've missed out things, etc. and that's what I'm trying to get hold of, this, the dynamic that comes from a sense that there's much more to this than we have encountered, but also that where art comes into it is different from the way that the sort of political philosophy, because there's a negotiation around, between the imaginable and the, and, the and the doable, and what's denounced, but also what's created. And that requires acute attention to what is brought into the world as art actualizes new virtualities. Uh, and they're not just instrumental in that, and that's where the sort of the shock, you know, that comes from artists suddenly making something visible for us or picking up something. So I, d I do think the, the negotiation, and it's not, you know, it, it's not just an either or, this is a good, but so what images we produce, and you go back and you keep rereading them, you know, and you say, oh my goodness, now I see this is an infinitely more powerful image I was unable to see, you know, with that. And I think that's partly this constantly suggesting that it's, it's a future in the making by a certain act of fidelity, but also a deep criticality. And that's why I think this one final thing about this intersectionality, I think we do an injustice to ourselves by continuing to talk about race, class, gender. I think it closes our thinking to the complexity of all of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're all of the same order. I mean, I, I certainly know because certain questions raised by feminism just keep slicing through every other ones of them in ways that need to be configured precisely how we live it. So if you just have races to do with race and genders to do with gender and class, nobody lives those. They, they live them in their complex textures. And I think artistic activities allow us to get that sense of the density in a, a certain person saying this is how I see it from a situated world. I think at that point. Thank you so much for your. Thank you for your papers. <laughs>